this is, uh, I think, a good counterpart to uh, Daryl's talk because uh, there really is a trade-off. I think the two most common causes for revision in adult deformity within the first couple of years if you leave out infection are uh, adjacent segment issues and uh, the second is non-union with rod fracture. And uh, just as Daryl has alluded to, as we develop new techniques to maybe reduce non-union, including creating stiffer constructs, we may be increasing the uh, problem of adjacent segment uh, issues. So it definitely is a balance and I think um, both uh, remain uh, significant issues. So these are my conflicts, uh, none of which directly relate to this topic. Um, so rod fracture continues to be a significant concern in these patients. Uh, and these are three or four different series showing uh, rates somewhere between 9 to 20 percent, depending on what population you're looking at. Uh, the lowest uh, site there, Justin Smith, is an ISSG paper, so multi-center uh, data uh, collected prospectively but analyzed retrospectively. And uh, we found a 9% overall rate, but a 22% uh, rate within uh, pedicle subtraction osteotomy patients. So higher rates of non-union as well as adjacent segment problems uh, with large uh, uh, sagittal corrections and uh, three-column osteotomy. So risk fractures for, or for risk factors rather for uh, pseudoarthrosis and rod fracture, uh, similar to the ones we were just looking at. Obesity is one, medical comorbidity, uh, ongoing infection obviously is one, but then revision cases, uh, cases requiring three column osteotomy. Uh, bone morphogenic protein is um, uh, one uh, prophylactic measure, and I'll talk a bit about that. Uh, osteoporosis medications uh, that are uh, that are in the bisphosphonates category are also uh, risk factors, and then it does uh, appear that uh, bigger diameter rods and stiffer material rods uh, do reduce the risk of rod fracture at least in the early going. And this complication also, typically it, there is a distinct timing to it, so it's not quite as acute as the junctional failures, uh, but it does occur within the first 12 months uh, to 24 months most commonly, although there are uh, fractures observed out past uh, even five years or later post-operatively. And this is a relatively limited data set because it's out of data collected only out past 12, 20, 24 months in most cases, so it doesn't have what the incidence is beyond that. And this is again from the article by Justin Smith, the, the, um, uh, this showing again the preponderance of these occurring at levels of the PSO, I guess is this, uh, does this have a, no, here we go, uh, no, does this have a light? I recommend using the cursor because the pointer doesn't show up. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, I see. Uh, but I, I don't have a keyboard here, do I? Yeah. Well, at any rate, these um, these are uh, PSOs, and these are the non-PSO patients. And you can see that in the PSO patients, the rod fractures typically occur around the osteotomy, whereas in the uh, non-PSO patients to the right, uh, a scattering, but a fair number that are down near the lumbosacral junction, so 4-5 or 5-1, and that tends to be the highest uh, risk. So there's a fusion grade classification uh, which uh, we've evaluated recently to try to see if it predicts rod fracture and we don't fully have that assessment but I think what we were able to show is that rod fracture uh, or uh, low fusion grade rather without uh, rod fracture tends not to have much to do with clinical outcomes. So I think in some ways it's similar to stratifying now patients that uh, may not have robust fusion. Uh, again, uh, similar to PJK versus uh, PJF, it's a lower level of clinical impact. Uh, but uh, we certainly uh, need to acknowledge that there is no gold standard, uh, certainly no radiographic gold standard for, spawn, for uh, full fusion. Uh, and I think rod fracture in most cases is a proxy for a true non-union, not exclusively perhaps, and I think most surgeons will 
testify that they've seen patients that have had fractured rods, but they'll swear the fusion is solid or certainly appears solid. And uh, I've had that experience myself. Uh, and I think though ultimately, uh, if we don't see a rod fracture, and this is something I counsel my patients, if we don't see a rod fracture, then really we just have to wait longer uh, to see if the fusion is solid. And, and we really, it's almost like uh, cancer follow-up. There's no safe zone, it seems like, any, anymore, at which we can say we're definitely done and your fusion is healed. So we hypothesize that a rod fracture is a more important issue clinically than radiographic fusion grade. And uh, this is an analysis of the ISSG database, again, uh, showing that that does tur turn out to be the case. So uh, patients that were judged as having a complete fusion versus an incomplete fusion uh, were about equal clinically. Uh, this is with ODI results. Uh, but the rod fracture patients, and particularly those with rod fracture who underwent revision, uh, report uh, worse clinical outcomes. Uh, and these are the an analogous scores with the uh, SF36 score. This didn't quite reach statistical significance, but you can see that there's a trend. Uh, similarly, for the SRS total score, uh, this was statistically significant. And uh, this is the activity score, also significant. Uh, the pain score, close to significant, but not quite. And uh, interestingly, it doesn't affect satisfaction. Again, I think we've uh, come to realize patient satisfaction is related to features other than clinical success in many cases. And this, I think, is an interesting slide as well. So we developed this lumbar stiffness disability index uh, looking at functional limitations due not to pain, uh, but due to stiffness of the lumbar spine, and found that that tracks separately from uh, pain in some situations. And I think this is another uh, illustration of that. So again, not much difference between those with radiographic grades, but you can see the LSDI score, which is uh, scored analogously to ODI, so higher LSDI scores indicates a higher uh, level of disability. It actually increases. So rod fracture occurs, clearly that should create more mobility. It's an indication of a lack of effusion. So presumably more mobility, but the patient is unable to uh, access that mobility, let's say, and so they actually feel stiffer and more disabled by stiffness despite the fact that they've got uh, restored mobility. And uh, so how do, we, uh, how do we deal with uh, rod fracture? And this is, uh, we'll break that into two pieces. One is how do we maybe reduce the incidence and then how do we deal with it when it does occur? So first of all, how do we reduce the incidence? And so I, I feel strongly that in adult spinal deformity, we should be using osteobiologics, and I do mean bone morphogenic protein in uh, most of these cases. And I think that there's, uh, that despite all of the ongoing uh, controversy, that uh, there's fairly good data uh, that demonstrates that. And one source is the uh, WashU data, uh, single source data showing uh, that there is a reduction of uh, non-union and there is a reduction of uh, revision for that diagnosis if we're using BMP. We actually found the same in our multi-center data from ISSG, and that turned out uh, to be um, uh, something that wasn't used uniformly among our surgeon sets. So about half of our surgeons used it, half of us doesn't, don't. And in that uh, comparison, we found that those using BMP, uh, independent of other issues, have a lower incidence of rod fracture. Uh, I'm certainly a be believer in Forteo, and I, I now get DEXA scans on everybody that's 55 and above. Whether that's the best uh, uh, screening tool or not, I, uh, I wouldn't argue with uh, Paul about his uh, expertise in that area at all. But uh, certainly if we uncover low bone density, we argue to use Forteo. Uh, we've had issues of um, disapproval by insurance companies as well. Uh, we drafted a letter arguing or explaining our rationale for it, and we've had better going in patients with osteopenia as opposed to osteoporosis uh, in terms of getting those approvals more recently with that approach. Uh, I think alignment planning is key, and this is actually a feature that uh, we didn't touch on completely in the uh, last talk, but I think we probably see lower rates of, uh, of adjacent segment uh, failure if we get the alignment about right. And by that, I'm talking about pelvic parameter to lumbar lordosis primarily, pelvic parameters to lumbar lordosis uh, primarily. Uh, I think if we either overcorrect or undercorrect, we're creating stresses probably uh, at the top of the construct and pre presumably also in, within the construct that may lead to uh, non-union. Uh, there is evidence for that concept in proximal junctional failure, but I'm not so sure we have it with, with respect to rod failure, but I think it makes good biomechanical sense. 
Um, again, without significant data, I would put forward that I like to use an A-lift still at 5.1 if it's a plump disc. Um, that's one that I think I have a hard time filling from the back, a harder time getting adequate lordosis uh, uh, with just a T-lift. And so if, if the L5-S1 disc is, has limited degeneration or still a fairly tall disc, I, I think an inner body from the front uh, probably gives us a better uh, discectomy and fill. I use inner bodies at all laminectomized levels. Again, I think that's uh, something that is without necessarily evidence to support it, but um, I've found that I have a, significant, a higher non-union rate, uh, I believe, in my hands if I've done a laminectomy and then are relying on a posterior-only fusion. Uh, and more recently, all of the mechanical things below, I have uh, gone to bigger rods. I think a lot of us have done that, uh, changing rod materials, uh, perhaps, uh, as well. Uh, and uh, I now have gone back to using bilateral pelvic fixation at, on every patient if I fuse to S1. I used to think if I had already a 5-1 fusion that we didn't necessarily need that. I've also done some unilateral pelvic screws and, and have had uh, fractures in the lower half or at the L5-S1 level uh, in that construct. So I think it is important to use bilateral fixation. They can be removed once the fusion is healed uh, if the patient uh, complains about them. And then I think increasingly we're using outrigger rods or quad rod constructs of some type uh, across three column osteotomies and T-lifts, and I'll show uh, some examples of that. So uh, there are a number of surgical options uh, for augmenting our constructs with uh, with ancillary rods, and uh, the x-ray on the right is a, a nice example of one uh, using a long, uh, essentially a long transverse connector uh, extending from top to bottom uh, between the paired rods. Of course, all manner of um, offset connectors and domino devices uh, to allow us to uh, customize these approaches. And here's a patient out of my own uh, practice that we took care of about two and a half years ago. He'd had a, a combination of surgery with an, uh, a posterior inner body fusion at 5.1 that had not healed, uh, a posterior spinal fusion at 4.5 that appeared to solidly have healed, and then a, an X stop at the 3.4 level and uh, clear problems with continued stenosis at that level as well as uh, sagittal imbalance. And uh, we treated him with... Uh, with an A-lift at 5.1 and then a three-column osteotomy at L3 uh, with an inner body at uh, the 2.3 the, um, uh, the level and then also a further uh, uh, posterior column osteotomy with T-lift at uh, the uh, level above that. Uh, and then quad rods extending past all of, the, um, uh, all of the lower lumbar levels from L2 through below the S1 pedicle screw uh, in this case, placed as outriggers. You can also use these across your osteotomy site. That's something I uh, will also do in which we correct the osteotomy through a short construct and then rod long past that. That's another version of what we'd call a quad rod technique. And this was at two years out um, and has what appears to be a nice solid fusion. Um, again, time will tell uh, how he does at the upper junction and whether this uh, truly is uh, solidly healed. This is another lady uh, that came to me with a uh, 10 to the pel or a 10 to 4 fusion and had developed a uh, really unstable segment at 4 or 5. It's, you can see it on the left if you can see that junction. Uh, it's a little uh, 4 to, four to um, uh, project, uh, but uh, that's about a grade 3, grade 2 to grade 3 spondylolisthesis at 4 or at four, 5. You can see how unstable it is in reducing on the uh, CT myelogram. She was actually, she had also undergone a proximal junctional procedure anteriorly of, of one additional level. Uh, and uh, she was actually on my schedule and was canceled uh, due to non-approval by the insurance company, uh, despite obviously a high level of disability and radiographic uh, uh, disease. Uh, but ultimately we gained uh, their approval and went forward and uh, did this as a staged uh, posterior anterior procedure with uh, essentially a VCR of four at the bottom. Was it put short pedicle screws in five and uh, left out uh, L3 uh, and came back from the front and completed the uh, A lift uh, there from three to uh, sacrum. And uh, here again, we've got an ancillary rod. This is just a third rod extending from about T below the T12 screw uh, down to uh, below the S1 pedicle screw.
And uh, you can see we didn't, ad didn't address her proximal junctional problem that uh, was not clearly symptomatic. And I think her overall uh, spinal alignment uh, improved with just correction at the lumbosacral junction. So even though that kyphosis is still there, she uh, certainly looks like she's tolerating it much better. So uh, how do we address uh, revision for rod fracture and pseudoarthrosis when it's present? Uh, I think, as I said, rod fracture in most cases is a proxy for pseudoarthrosis. So the first observation is that the rod fracture means you likely have an area that has failed to fuse. Uh, and I think the other important clinical aspect of this is that it is a non-emergent situation. Almost all of these are not neurologic issues, uh, and oftentimes there's a great deal of consternation both by the patients, sometimes by referring doctors or ED doctors, uh, that this is something that needs emergent attention. And, and I think it's important to uh, take a step back and, and settle the patient down, first of all. Some of these do seem to settle down, at least for a time, uh, if not uh, permanently, uh, with conservative measures. And you can try things like a bone stem, initiating Forteo, uh, initiating PT, particularly if only one rod is fractured uh, at that point. Uh, and typically, I won't reoperate unless both rods have clearly fractured and the patient uh, remains uh, symptomatic. So uh, uh, the radiographic workup in my hands is usually a, a CT scan. In some cases, we'll get a bone scan. The goal here is to determine what levels are not fully fused. Um, if I'm still unsure, a lot of times I'll go from the back first, and then we can test various segments in, uh, mechanically, which is, I think, the best ability to demonstrate is it fused or is it not fused. Uh, and uh, alternatively, if you only have, say, a, a couple of levels that you're wondering about, you might include both of those via uh, an anterior approach uh, and then do the posterior approach second. But typically, uh, we do both a, a combination of anterior and posterior, and the reason being you need to revise the fixation posteriorly, and I believe in most cases we're going to be more successful at gaining fusion by accessing the inner body space, uh, and uh, the revision and nature of it makes uh, TLF a bit tricky, uh, and and doing only a posterior fusion, I think, is less likely to succeed because you've got the compromised uh, uh, bone uh, and scarring uh, posteriorly. Uh, so typically what I will do is use a transoas approach at L4 and above uh, for revision anterior. I still do a straight anterior uh, inner body at 5.1 in most cases. Uh, that may change now with the O-lift technique, and I haven't uh, mastered that, but uh, uh, I'm interested in, in uh, seeing how that affects uh, this approach. Uh, and then the posterior instrumentation, really I try to limit what we do there, and in most cases we don't have to remove a lot of hardware and just put outrigger fixation uh, spanning uh, the fractured rods, uh, which reduces the overall impact of uh, the operation. I think it's also important if we uh, have ongoing uh, deformity issues to consider the, uh, this as an opportunity for further alignment change, uh, particularly sagittal plane correction uh, as you do the revision. So here's a couple of examples out of my uh, practice. This is a woman that came to me initially with a relatively modest curve. I think this is one listening and thinking about this that maybe we could have done the first time with a shorter segment construct, uh, but uh, at that time, uh, I uh, ended up doing a T10 to the pelvis fusion, and this functioned very nicely for her. She was delighted despite uh, what you can see in, as the proximal junctional uh, kyphosis, and there is a, a, a moderate fracture there, but she was never really very bothered by that clinically and um, provided her nice relief of her uh, low back and leg pain. And this was one that out after five years came back uh, with a visible rod fracture on one side, and uh, that turned out to be a bilateral issue, and she had a non-union at the level immediately above the, uh, the last inner body at 3-4. Uh, so we revised this uh, via the technique I just described, doing uh, X-lifts at uh, 1, 2, and 2, 3 here, and then outrigger rods posteriorly spanning uh, the fractured hardware. Uh, and it's too soon to know uh, her outcome. She's about a year out now from uh, this revision and so far has been quite happy with the result. One thing I do notice and I don't have an explanation for is a lot of times the recurrent symptoms here include not only back pain but leg pain even though there's no radiographic evidence of stenosis. And uh, I guess in my own mind I think that may be a traction phenomenon that there's now motion restored around roots that are adherent and, and tethered and maybe getting uh, tugged on. I don't know. But she certainly had uh, a lot of complaints of leg pain as well as um, uh, back pain, and we didn't do any decompressive work, obviously, with this revision. Uh, 
And then one further case is a woman with uh, uh, Parkinson's disease and uh, thoracolumbar kyphosis uh, that we uh, operated on with a, uh, a long uh, construct. We treated her with Forteo posteriorly, or sorry, for six months preoperatively, and uh, uh, then did a, a posterior construct. And she also was very happy with this result until the rod fractures occurred at about one year postoperatively. One uh, technique that we didn't talk about in terms of PJF is uh, the uh, rib fa fixation proximally. This is an example of one of the methods we've used to do that. These are a, a vector device placed around the UIV plus one rib uh, and then no fusion done uh, to that level. So it's a soft tether uh, and uh, we did about 30 of these and, and haven't had to revise any of them so far uh, for PJF. Uh, we've had some that have had fractures uh, but none of them that have been symptomatic or progressive enough to warrant uh, revision surgery. We've also used the spinous process tethering, and I, I am a big advocate of uh, posterior column uh, augmentation, I'll call it, uh, as a, a prophylactic approach uh, to avoid proximal junctional problems. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that in the lab uh, with anybody who's interested. But uh, with respect to the rod fracture, you can see she's got bilateral fractures and a pseudoarthrotic uh, cleft at the L4-5 level. And uh, so similarly to that last case, we came in and did a, uh, an x lift uh, and uh, then a uh, posterior um, outrigger around the rod fractures. And again, too soon to know whether that's solidly fused, but it certainly looks like there's a fair amount of bone in the cage. And uh, um, she's had a reduction in her symptoms back now to about where she was uh, prior to the rod fracture. So I don't know if I need my conclusion slide, but basically the conclusion slide repeats everything I just said in a very much shorter version. Can we stop with that? Thanks, Bob. <laughs>